Control is an incredibly impressive piece of work. It's a game that dares to be unique in a world of repeats, rip-offs, remakes, and sequels. With a distinctive style, interesting story, and fun gameplay, Remedy provides a complete package with this entry. Control's story intrigues and also perfects the Remedy style. This new blend of live action media and video game is the peak of what Remedy had tried at many times before. It works so well in Control's world. Speaking of that, the world of Control is incredibly interesting as well. It wears its inspirations on its sleeve, clearly taking from things like the X-Files, Twin Peaks, and SCP, but what the game creates is something wholly its own. The story keeps you guessing every moment of the way. It gives you just enough to wonder and just enough to be interested in what's to come, but not enough to spoil what is coming. On top of that, Control has tons of extra information that doesn't have to do with main stories or side quests. Hundreds of documents exist only to build up the world and interest you in this place a little more. This creates a picture of what the world was like before you began to inhabit it. This picture is so interesting that you can't help but look for more. Aesthetically, Control is also top tier. Its environments represent a caricature of brutalist architecture, juxtaposed with the contemporary bland and bleak offices of a bureau that's meant to control incredibly interesting and colorful things in the world. Meanwhile, the game still finds a way to create moments of color. It's not all black and gray, and Control very much has a red and black motif. Most of the aesthetic design choices here are perfect, and the game is just wonderful to look at. With a variety of skills and powers to use, Control also feels intense to play. Fighting groups of enemies, flinging rocks and barrels at the bad guys can be both fast-paced and fun. When we eventually get stronger, we feel that as well in the game. There's a weight to combat that other games just don't seem to have. It's impactful in your hands, not just on the screen. But Control's pros don't just end there. Destructible environments, a broadening of the Remedy world, some fantastic characters and presentation. This game has it all. It feels genuinely like a full package. This doesn't mean that it's the perfect game, it just means that it is very much well-rounded and even across its entire playtime. Control really feels like Remedy has found their niche. They've had time to realize what works and what doesn't. They've ironed out the kinks in their formula, and this complete picture is what we get. Control. Today, we're going to take a look at this fantastic game. We'll be taking a deep dive, talking about gameplay, story, mechanics, and everything in between. If you haven't seen my previous videos on Remedy's games, Alan Wake, Quantum Break, and even the Max Payne series, you should go watch those now. I would also highly recommend watching the Alan Wake one specifically because Control has a piece of Alan Wake related DLC and when talking about it, I will inevitably spoil some of the story. If you enjoy the videos, make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. It helps boost that algorithm so I can continue making videos like this. You can also support the channel by subscribing on Patreon, where I upload longer versions of my full series retrospectives and scattered text post updates. You can also follow me on Twitch, where I play games that I'm not currently reviewing and ramble like a madman. Spoilers for Control. Hey Dad, it's me, your favorite son, and today... I'd like to talk about Control. Control began development before Remedy's previous game, Quantum Break, was even released. Mikhail Kasurinen, who had worked on Alan Wake as the lead gameplay designer and Quantum Break as the lead director, returned to work on Control as the game's director. When Quantum Break was finishing development, Mikael had the idea that their next game should have a more open world that let the players choose what they experience. They wanted to shift focus from a complex story to a more interesting universe and world. This didn't mean that the narrative wouldn't be focused on, but that the world would be put at the forefront for this entry. This meant putting tons of documents, audio logs, and videos for players to find and interact with when they wanted to. The first idea that the team had was creating the FBC, or Federal Bureau of Control. In the game, this organization controls, categorizes, reports, and monitors different paranormal events, objects, or people. 
This idea was built atop of the incredibly popular collaborative writing project called SCP. SCP stands for Secure, Control, Protect. The SCP Foundation is a fictional organization, much like the FBC, that controls paranormal objects or creatures. Each numbered SCP is generally a small entry listed as a file on some sort of object or creature with strange properties. These can range from creatures made of concrete that disappear when not looked at, an infinite staircase inhabited by a creeping entity, or an IKEA store that houses a pocket dimension and hostile creatures. SCP has spawned many pieces of media, video games, animated films, live action, it's inspired a certain genre of internet horror, and is probably responsible for the modern popularization of creepypasta in general to a new generation. I did go back through and read some old SCP for this video though, and I have to say that it's pretty hit or miss. I definitely thought these things were much cooler when I was a kid. Back then, there was a certain implication, or at least a fantasy, in my mind that these could be real. I knew they weren't, but there was a little thought in the back of my head that just kept saying, what if? Now they've seemed to age a little poorly. I do think that Control does their version of SCPs a lot better, though, in my opinion. We'll talk about that in depth in a bit. The goal with the FBC was to create a new entry in weird fiction, or new weird. Instead of going for straight-up scares or the big horror that we normally see in games of that genre, the developers of Control wanted to create a consistent sense of fear throughout the game. Remedy wanted to use an older style of technology in Control, slide projectors and floppy disks, for example. The team took inspiration from brutalist architecture for the oldest house. Stuart McDonald, the world designer for Control, said that brutalism has a sense of power, weight, strength, and stability to it. The building itself is a prison for the weird. The team used real-world buildings for inspiration, like the AT&T Long Lines building. Brutalism was most popular in the 50s during post-war UK. The design is characterized by minimalist styles with basic building materials, usually using exposed concrete or brick. The team was also inspired by films, Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange, The Shape of Water, and Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy all provided a good base for oppressive agencies and ritualism in organized offices or bureaus. The team also took inspiration from books like Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer, and much more obviously, House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski. One of the team's biggest objectives was to create an environment that would encourage the player to explore and find things themselves. Remedy accomplished this by simplifying the design of the UI, using a more minimalist outline for the interface. This causes players to have to use mission descriptions to solve quests or find objectives. The game was also another huge step for the team in terms of tech and graphics. It was one of the first large releases to include real-time ray tracing with DirectX. Remedy partnered this time with 505 Games to publish Control rather than Microsoft. This time, though, they would retain the IP rights, unlike Quantum Break. The game was originally codenamed P7 and was later revealed at E3 2018. Control was released on August 27, 2019 for PlayStation 4, Microsoft Windows, and Xbox One. A few notes before we get into things. I played the Ultimate Edition of Control that was released for the current generation of consoles. I played the PlayStation 5 version of the game for this video. This version of the game is slightly upgraded graphically for the new systems. It also includes all of the previous free content updates and paid DLCs, Foundation, and AWE, both of which we'll be talking about towards the end of the video. Control begins with a narration from our main character, Jesse Faden. Jesse is talking to some sort of disembodied presence, something we'll learn a lot more about as the game goes on. She's following the directions of this presence, which has led her to the Federal Bureau of Control. She describes her situation as staring at a poster on a wall, alone in a room. She says that the poster is a lie, that the poster is not the world. The world is larger, stranger, hidden behind a hole past the poster. This is similar to Plato's The Allegory of the Cave. The shadows on the wall of the cave are reality to the ones who dwell there. Jessie arrives at the FBC, the place that supposedly holds this hidden world that she speaks of. 
The place seems to be abandoned, though. We can collect some memos that give us a picture of the way the Bureau operates. One that has a list of items that are banned from the building, a very redacted memo seemingly about a dangerous shark, and one about some innocuous R4 reports that need to be turned in by everyone. We can find portraits of some important people in the FBC, namely Dr. Darling, the head of research, Zachariah Trench, the director, and the janitor. We encounter the janitor soon after this, whose name is Ati. He seems to think that we've come to apply for the job of janitor's assistant. He tells us to head to the director for an interview. When we head back to where the portrait of the janitor was, it's been replaced with an elevator. Jesse revealed that she saw behind the poster when she was 11 and has been trying to see the real world ever since. This is our short introduction to the game. We then get an intro sequence that's actually a beautiful selection of different renders. This short movie sets the game's atmosphere and tone incredibly well. I'd also like to point out that before we get too further, I should note that Jesse Faden is played by Courtney Hope, who also played Beth Wilder in Quantum Break. She's not the only returning Remedy actor, though. Zachariah Trench is played by James McCaffrey, the voice of Max Payne and Thomas Zane. The voice of Alan Wake, Matthew Peretta, returns as well as both the voice of Alan Wake and a new character, Casper Darling. Remedy certainly has its cast, and I think it really works for them. James McCaffrey is a classic, his voice and likeness are both S-tier material, and he always does a great job. Marshall especially, my head of operations. She sees right through me. Matthew Peretta is again great, this time providing a completely different performance in a completely different character. This excited, detached, and intelligent head of research is a perfect role for him, and he fits the part both physically and vocally. We don't have the details, but when things started flying around the disc, it was transferred to us. It's an object of power. Courtney Hope also plays a great main character, providing an almost archetypal protagonist performance. You can feel the jaded past through her voice, and she does a great job throughout the whole game. As we head to the director's office, we can see something is wrong by finding some memos from Trench that says he can't trust them. Heading into the office, we find Trench dead. The presence tells Jesse to pick up the gun. We then get to talk to the board, a mysterious entity that exists within the astral plane. The board is some sort of strange being or gathering of beings that presides over the oldest house. They speak in strange terms with certain words often being replaced or joined with their opposites. We see a video from Dr. Darling about objects of power. Objects of power are objects that have been affected by an altered world event. These items are usually connected to the astral plane, and the weapon that the director left behind was one of them. This is our main weapon for the entire game. We're given a quick tutorial on combat here, or at least how to use the service weapon. This seems like a good time to dive deep into Control's combat because there's actually a lot to it. Like I said before, our main weapon of the game is the service weapon. This is a simple pistol that we can use to defeat enemies. We have a small meter below it that measures our ammo, but this recharges slowly and has to recharge fully when we drain it. This isn't the only thing that the service weapon can do though, it can be modified quite a lot. We can first modify its form to change the firing capability of the weapon. The first form that we get when we inherit the weapon is grip. This is very similar to a revolver or any other pistol. It's single shot and deals a decent amount of damage. Shatter works more like a shotgun. It's a wide blast and has more of a spread out pattern. Spin works more like a machine gun with a high rate of fire and less accuracy. Pierce is similar to a sniper, low ammo and high accuracy that deals large damage. Charge works like a grenade launcher or rockets. It has low ammo and high damage, but has a large radius of explosion. The final one actually comes from the AWE DLC and is called Surge. It fires grenades that stick to enemies or surfaces, and then of course explodes. With all these forms, this isn't even the end to the level of modification that comes with the service weapon. We can choose two of these forms to equip at any time and switch them out during combat. But each of these forms can also take up to three weapon modifications based on how much we've upgraded it, which can add damage, ammo recharge, or even modify other powers. 
The service weapon itself is an interesting object of power and actually makes anyone who wields it the new director of the FBC. It also seems like the weapon actually adjusts based on the person that's wielding it. It's only the first of many paranatural items that we will see throughout the game, but it's one of the most important. Control also has a skill system. We get many different abilities throughout the course of the game. Using these abilities costs energy, a small bar at the top of the screen that works pretty similarly to our ammo. One of the earliest abilities we get, and probably the most useful, is Launch. This allows us to throw objects at enemies or just manipulate them telekinetically. If we don't have an object within vision, we will just begin to pull concrete out of the floors or the walls. I should also point out here that Control's environment is incredibly destructible. We will tear apart walls and objects by dashing, throwing enemies into things, or shooting grenades around. It's incredible the amount of destruction that actually exists here, and it adds to the open feeling of the game. It really makes each fight feel like a battleground. We are not leaving the land unscathed here. We also gain the ability to create a shield later, which will protect us from enemy attacks. Seize will allow us to take control of a low health enemy and force them to fight against their compatriots. Levitate, the last main ability that we gain in the game, allows us to float above the ground for a period before slowly descending. Launch and Levitate are probably my two most used abilities throughout the course of my playthrough. Launch does some massive damage when it's upgraded, and Levitate is fantastic traversal for both avoiding enemy attacks and just getting around. The other thing I have to say here is that most of the abilities and controls combat in general are incredibly fun. Floating around the world and tossing desks at the hiss just always feels great. It really feels like Remedy has perfected their combat in this game. There are some moments where we can just get hit with something that takes us out immediately, which I would say is the only downside, but for the most part the fighting is incredibly fun. Each of these abilities can also be adjusted from the skill tree. We can gain straight up damage for things like launch or increase the amount of health we have. But we can also alter levitate so that we can ground slam enemies from above. We can explode our shield and use it to attack enemies. We can unlock multi-launch, which allows us to launch multiple objects at once. There's a lot of variety here with powers, and even though we unlock most of these pretty quickly, it does feel like they develop more and more throughout the course of the game. We can also get mods which adjust these powers, or Jesse's stats in general. These mods, just like the weapon ones, can be picked up from enemies, in chests, or earned through quests. These can add more health, energy, give us more launch damage, more ammo when levitating. There's a massive variety of builds that we can go for here. The mods just add another level of variety and intricacy to the combat in the game. I will say that I didn't really change mods much towards the end of my playthrough. You also get so many of these that I constantly had to take the time to get rid of them in the menus and make more space for the rare ones. When we complete the Astral Challenge, we are given the service weapon. We see visions of Zachariah Trench, the previous director, providing us insight on the job. Jessie has no idea what's going on, but she's at least happy that she knows what's behind the poster. We start to see visions of Jessie, live-action footage of her surrounded in red. She's almost overtaken by some sort of other presence, but it's stopped by the presence that she has in her head. We then begin to fight our first enemies of the game, the Hiss. These are the antagonists of Control, a spreading, pervasive presence that's begun to try and take over the oldest house. We see more visions of Trench who tells us to get to the hotline. We can find some memos around the building that begin to show the bureaucracy that's involved in the FBC. Important things like costs for responding to AWEs placed right beside a new supplier for coffee filters. We eventually arrive at Central Executive, which is crawling with hiss. We take them out and learn to cleanse control points. These control points will be scattered throughout the oldest house. These are our checkpoints of a sort. They allow us to upgrade abilities, fast travel, craft upgrades for the service weapon, and change our outfit. We can also take on something called board countermeasures, which are small quests that will give us weapon mods. The control points themselves are important parts of the oldest house. The devices set up at the control points are there to prevent building shifts. 
The oldest house itself is a mystery. The building is constantly shifting, constantly changing. It also doesn't appear to people outside of it. You can't see it unless you know about it or have a reason to be there. To the average person, they just wouldn't ever notice it. The oldest house also seems to not be able to interface with modern technology. This is the in-world excuse for the Bureau using all sorts of outdated tech and equipment. Jesse meets Emily Pope, Dr. Darling's assistant, who's currently in one of the shelter rooms. Emily already knows Jesse because she calls her the new director. Emily wears an HRA device on her chest that protects her from being taken over by the hiss. Throughout most conversations that Jesse has, we constantly get insights into her thoughts, her short comments to the presence. Like, do you know my brother Dylan? Not yet. This provides us a view into her mind, what she's thinking. We learn that Jesse is hiding the fact that she's here looking for her brother Dylan, and that Jesse has some past with the Bureau. Emily wants Jesse to cleanse some more control points to push the hiss out of the building. She tries to cleanse a corrupted agent, but it kills her. Jesse talks to Emily again, coming clean and telling her that the Bureau was involved in an AWE in Ordinary, her hometown when she was a child. Emily refers to Ordinary as Ground Zero. Emily doesn't know much about the event other than that it was a big event. Pope tells Jesse that Dr. Darling would know more about Ordinary. Our next goal is to go find the hotline, a device that will allow us to contact Trench. He might know more about how to get rid of the hiss, so we can find Darling and Jesse can learn more about Ordinary and her brother. We have to head over to the communications department to find the hotline. The nice thing about Control's environment and quest design is it tries to make you actually look for locations. I say try because it's sort of a mix of the modern open world waypoint system and the classic forcing you to actually look around for signs in the world. We still get waypoints on the map, but they can be pretty vague depending on the mission. Finding new departments usually requires us to actually look at signs around the world and seek these places out, which can be pretty interesting. That being said, some areas of the oldest house are a little linear, so you're just running forward and eventually hitting an end point. The places that are more open with multiple pathways tend to follow this broad design a little better and I think fit better with what Remedy wanted to do in regards to their open world. When it works, it works, and when it doesn't, it's still better than an exact objective marker and HUD telling us how many meters we need to go before we reach our destination. Heading toward communications, we'll eventually reach a department called Dead Letters. Here we can find some videos from Dr. Darling about paranatural topics, and the first in a really interesting series of videos called The Threshold Kids. It at first seems to be a TV program made by the Bureau as a sort of propaganda for the families of the people working there. The first one is very dark, seeing a child getting a letter saying that their mother is missing. These strange and bleak films paint a very dark picture of the Bureau, the people involved in it, and everything surrounding paranatural entities. Daddy, I'm a third person! Dad says my mama went missing in action. She walked into the city and didn't come back. Remedy loves to flirt with the idea of horror. This was clear in Alan Wake, where the entire concept was based around horror, and there were definitely some spooky elements. The entire atmosphere was pushing a sort of schlocky horror. Even Max Payne had some horror elements in it, the dream sequences being a particularly dark example. Quantum Break didn't have this as much, but Control had quite a lot of atmosphere to it. There are many creepy moments, and its entire aesthetic has an underlying fear to the whole thing. The game seems to want us to be afraid, but not afraid as if we're creeping down a dark hallway waiting for something to jump out at us, but afraid of what we're up against. The game doesn't want us to be afraid of being scared or caught by surprise, it wants us to be afraid of ideas. The ideas of the world that we're thrust into, the ideas of our enemies, the ideas of altered items and AWEs in general. There's also the Bureau itself, the fact that an organization like this could exist with the public having no knowledge of anything like this even happening is kind of scary in and of itself. Again, Control is not a horror game by any means, but just looking at the design, color, aesthetics, and some of the cutscenes in isolation, you'd be fooled into thinking so. 
Dead Letters itself is probably one of my favorite departments. Its sole purpose is to archive and categorize the letters that are sent to or found by the Bureau. Most of these have no paranatural connection whatsoever, but they do end up being really funny. Specifically, the one about James Bartholomew, who has written in to say that he is in contact with all of the dead presidents of the United States and wants to know how he could be of use. This also showcases and juxtaposes the public's view of AWEs versus what paranatural things actually occur. Most people seemingly are not aware of the actual existence of any of these things, and their interest is misplaced. Through communications, we find an object of power called the floppy disk that seems to have gone rogue and is launching stuff around the room. We can get close to these items and cleanse them. This usually requires us to complete an astral challenge and will provide us with a power. This is where we get the launch ability. We end up having to fight Tomasi, who's a flying hiss. He's our first boss, though he really isn't that complicated. Alberto Tomasi actually used to be the head of communications at the Bureau, but he's been turned by the hiss. We defeat him, but he just gets away. We end up finding the hotline off in the distance with no way to get there. When we pull the light switch cord three times, we arrive at the Ocean View Motel. This is a place that will appear in many different missions throughout Control. It's an interesting place because Jesse remarks that she's been here before. She hasn't, actually. The Ocean View Motel exists as the idea of every roadside motel, possibly existing before these motels as some sort of blueprint, like Plato's World of Forms, but for chintzy motels that exist off the highway. This place is also an intermediary space. It's a place in between and can be used to affect the physical world. Here, we usually have to solve a puzzle to unlock a door so that we can move forward. This usually involves changing certain things in the rooms to match each other, which will then produce the key that we need. We can again pull the cord and traverse to the hotline. We can use this phone to contact the board. Through this, we get some communications from Trench about his management team. We tell Emily about what happened and that we need to find the department heads. The two we're looking for now are Salvador, head of security, and Marshall, the head of operations. The oldest house is on lockdown, though, and we can't use the sector elevator. Emily is impressed with Jesse's abilities and wants to run tests on her, but she doesn't want Emily to know about the presence inside of her. Before we head to the maintenance area and get the lockdown dealt with, we see some visions of Ati the janitor. He's the next person we need to find. The sector elevator can only head to his department, maintenance. On our way, we cleanse an object of power, the merry-go-round horse, which gives us the ability to evade. We eventually find Ati in his office. Ati wants us to work for him for a bit before we get to the directorial override. We have to fix some cooling pumps and power generators, otherwise the power plant is going to blow up. He also gives us access to some side quests on his board to clean up the building. We can meet up with the chief of security, Arish. Based on what he says, it seems like Darling was aware of the Hiss threat before they arrived. Heading through maintenance, we have to find two different areas where we can fix the issues with the sector. We eventually free the lockdown controls and have to use the service weapon to lift it. This opens the sector elevator up to the different areas of the oldest house. When we return to Emily, Jesse tells her about her younger brother, Dylan. When they were kids, they found a slide projector that created doorways to other realities. A presence in one of the doorways helped to turn the projector off. This is the presence that is connected to Jesse, the one that she still talks to now. This is when the FBC showed up and took Dylan, but Jesse managed to escape. Jesse said that the FBC took the slide projector, but Emily has never heard of it. She does tell us that Trench and Darling were involved in the ordinary event, and that there's a large part of the containment sector that's designated to it. Emily thinks that the being connected to Jesse is incredibly powerful. Marshall went to the research sector, and we have to find her now. She may have information on P6, one of the candidates of the Prime Candidate Program, a project developed to flesh out future possible directors of the Bureau. We see a vision of Ati who says that we owe him now because he helped us. When we head to the research center, this is where the game's world, the oldest house, really begins to open up. There are a ton of different little areas to explore, ones connected to side quests and ones not. We find some sort of strange being in research that is unkillable. We can't damage it. We have to lure it into a containment chamber and close the doors on it. 
One of the most interesting parts of Control's story and atmosphere is that it has an air of being based around real things. Not actually real things, but it takes some myths, urban legends, conspiracies, and occult aspects and warps it into its own worldview. Even things like the astral plane have already existed as a concept in old classical religions and was popularized by the Rosicrucians. It's generally viewed as a plane that exists in between life and death, a sort of limbo between rebirth. It also has its place in astral projection, which is another subject entirely on its own. This is just one example of how Control incorporates real-world ideas or things into its own world. This again makes it feel real, because the FBC and its dealings are so obscured. We feel like any of this could be happening, but we just don't know it. This gives the world more of a reality, more of a solidified place in the world rather than just a fantasy image. We head through research and can stumble upon a side quest that lets us bind to the X-Ray light box, which allows us to take control of enemies. We eventually talk to Marshall through an intercom in the research sector. We find her in the luck and probability department. She tells us to find Dr. Darling's HRA lab located in the sector. Once we find it, we have to solve a puzzle involving punch cards. We have to match up the cards based on the whiteboard drawings around the lab. Once we activate the HRA machine, it shatters the prism used to activate it. It was a special black rock prism, so we need to head to the quarry located below. Jessie asks Marshall about her brother, but she tells us that she can only talk about Dylan once the machine is activated. The lives that they'll save are more important for now. We can head to Black Rock Quarry and cleanse a safe object of power on the way that gives us the shield ability. We have to use the Ocean View Motel again to get to Black Rock Processing. When we arrive at the quarry, we can find a prism and take it back to Marshall. She tells us about Dylan, who was candidate P6. He was very powerful and was stronger than any other candidate that was being looked at for the position of director. His power overtook him and Dylan wasn't fit to be the director. She tells Jesse that he's being kept in the containment sector. At this point, Jesse really begins to lose control of exactly who she can trust. She began opening up to people like Emily, but the fact that they captured Dylan means she really doesn't know if they're on her side. The only thing she can really do now is head to find Dylan. We can head through the containment sector and we'll eventually arrive at the Panopticon. This one is also one of my favorite areas in the game. There are so many holding cells here for altered items or objects of power. These could be anything from a fridge to a typewriter. With such little information, these usually get our mind running with ideas. What could these lesser known about altered items be? Are they harmless or so incredibly powerful that we don't even know about them? The vertical environment design is also fantastic as this place goes up quite a few floors. We meet Langston, who runs the containment sector. He tells us to subdue the Benikoff TV object of power. We head up and end up fighting Salvador, who's also been taken over by the Hiss. Once we take him out and cleanse the TV, we gain the Levitate ability. Like I said before, the Levitate ability is one of the most useful in combat. It gives us traversal for avoiding attacks and gaining the high ground on enemies below us, but it's also useful for exploration. It allows us to access many more areas that we couldn't before. The oldest house also holds some secret areas that are hidden, tucked away in the environment. Just finding these hidden spots will give us an ability point and also some mods and chests. Once we gain the Levitate ability, we can access the fifth floor of the Panopticon. Upstairs is where Dylan should have been held, but he's escaped. Emily says that Dylan is with them, though. He gave himself up to the Bureau. Dylan has been affected by the Hiss, but it's different than what they've seen. He seems to have control over it, at least to an extent. Dylan is being kept upstairs. He's muttering different things. When he talks to Jesse, he's speaking as if he isn't Dylan. He blames Trench and Darling for making him not Dylan. He says that the Hiss have improved him. He's clearly being overtaken by the entity. It's also interesting to note here that Dylan is played by Sean Dury, who was the original actor for the Quantum Break lead. Dylan names the being that she has a connection with. He calls it Polaris, and Dylan seems to now harbor some resentment towards Polaris for not saving him from the Bureau. 
Jesse learns that the slide projector is still in the Bureau, and somehow that's connected to the Hiss and Dylan's current state. Dylan tries to convince Jesse that the Hiss is actually better than the Bureau. He tries to say that they're against them, working from behind the scenes. He tells us to go to the Prime Candidate program to find the truth. We can head there and find a video of Dr. Darling talking about Ordinary. He speaks specifically about Dylan and how important he is to the Bureau. We can find transcripts of conversations with Dylan and a list of injuries that people near him sustained. It's very clear that Dylan didn't want to be at the Bureau and wasn't very cooperative. We then find a room with a ton of information on Jessie herself. It seems like she'd been tracked for most of her life. They even have recordings of her therapy sessions. We can eventually track down the actual report about the ordinary event. It tells us that the slide projector opened a door to other realities and caused the disappearance of the town's adult population. Only 17 people survived the event. We then find the ordinary AWE, a massive room that's an exact layout of the town and the radius of the event itself. Everything here is modeled out. Then we find something even wilder, that the entire dump from Ordinary, where Jesse and Dylan found the projector, was brought to the FBC. We search Dr. Darling's lab and find a video diary from him. He took the projector to the research sector. This leads us to dimensional research, to a very strange corridor that constantly warps and loops itself. Ati has his janitor cart nearby with some music playing, though, so maybe he knows something about it. In his office, we find a painting that taps us into Ati's visions. We have to follow these visions to find him. We end up taking a long, hanging cab ride deeper into maintenance, and along the way, hear a song that seems to be sung by the mysterious janitor himself. Ati is at the end of this restricted area. He gives us his cassette player with a song on it that will supposedly get us through the maze so that we can find the slide projector. Heading back through the ashtray maze, we will be pushed and guided by the corridors themselves. We have to head through many areas, destroying all manner of hiss. This is probably one of my favorite sequences in the game. The song that Ati gave us is actually called Take Control, a song written for the game by the old gods of Asgard. This is the same band featured in Alan Wake that are, in all actuality, the real-life band Poets of the Fall. The environment itself in this area is constantly shifting. Doors are facing downward and walls begin moving. The whole thing looks great and is very fun to traverse. On top of that, backing it by this Poets of the Fall song makes it even more impactful. It almost feels like the final climb to the height of the mountain. We're slashing enemies away and taking out goons while listening to this heavy pumping ballad. On the other side of the maze, we arrive at Dimensional Research. The slide projector still isn't there. It's been moved once more. We can find a video of Darling talking about the projector. There was one slide remaining after the ordinary incident. Darling had been making expeditions into the reality that the slide opened up. They eventually located an entity inside of the slide. The entity is actually Hedron, a massive being that existed inside of slide 36. Here, we have to free this entity from the siphons hooked up to it. We have to defeat waves of enemies and cleanse different dishes pointed at the machine. Once this happens, Polaris seems to be gone from Jesse, and she's overtaken by the hiss, convinced that nothing was behind the poster. We get our end credits, and the game is over. Except that's not the end for our story. This is a fake ending, as we really begin to see once we actually watch what's in the credits. Different messages overtaking the text on the screen. I really like this part, and I think it really exemplifies the game pushing itself into reality, blurring the lines between what's real and what's fake. Also, the aesthetics of the text slowly melting away, just black and white, is just gorgeous and really, really well done. It's, uh... We take control of Jessie again, but she's working in the Bureau, the new hire at the federal agency. We have three tasks, to deliver mail, tidy up the coffee cups, and scan the forms. We can do this forever, but we eventually find out that our mission is called Take Control. Control is 
clearly a very large theme for the entire game. It almost permeates every aspect of the game itself. The entire story is based around Jessie taking control, and this is her big moment. But her entire life, she hasn't had control. She's been constantly watched by the Bureau, not knowing the wiser, and control has been wrested from her hands. The Hiss themselves control other people. Even things like the Seize ability allow us to control the Hiss. Truly, all of our powers are about controlling Jesse's innate abilities and, to an extent, the environment around us. It's quite an obvious theme, considering it's the title of the game, but it's worth noting here. But in this moment, Jesse finally learns to take control. Take control of her life, of herself, make her own destiny, rather than leaving it to be manipulated by the shadows. I think this moment is great, and it's something we've all wrestled with from time to time. It can be hard to be inside of it, to be in the thing, and try to see it from the outside, to try and see that you need to take the reins rather than let them take you. Jessie eventually grabs the director's mail and takes it to him, but when she does, she sees a vision of Dylan killing her. She's then returned to the beginning of the loop. This time around, she realizes that the Hiss were allowed to slip into reality and took Trench over. He then was controlled and let them into our world through the projector. Jessie realizes her real goal is to defeat the Hiss. The final loop sees Jessie taking the service weapon and killing Trench. This is almost a symbolic taking over of the director's position for her, finally seeing her realize her role in all of this and accept it. She hears Darling on the hotline. He tells Jesse that Hedron is gone, but it was a catalyst, not a source. She has to go to Dr. Darling's office. That's our next step, and inside the motel we see Darling performing a wacky song on a projector. When Jesse leaves the motel, she sees herself with Polaris surrounding her. Polaris is still alive. She's a part of Jesse now. But Polaris was always there. Hedron taught Jesse how to awaken Polaris. Or at least, that's what it seems. She reconciles with the fact that she isn't sure of any of this, and she doesn't really need to be. I think this is another staple of Remedy games. Most of the time, it's literally the developers saying to the audience that we shouldn't be so concerned with details. The emotion of the thing is what's more important. What does the piece say rather than how is the piece saying it? Trench's need for control over the FBC caused him to become corrupted. Jessie didn't meet the same fate. She was able to stop the hiss from overtaking her. We have one final level where we have to traverse a warped part of the oldest house and get to Dylan. When we do, Jessie uses her power to cleanse the hiss from him. Dylan is then stable, but the Hiss are still in the oldest house. They need to lift the lockdown, but it won't be able to be lifted until the Hiss have been extinguished. The game ends seeing Jesse truly take on her role as director of the Federal Bureau of Control. Now, there's a lot still left to be done even after we've beaten the main story of Control. As the game tells us after we complete its main story, your work is not done. There are many side quests that we can take on throughout the game. These side quests are actually some of my favorite parts of the game. We've already talked about some of the ones that you more naturally encounter through the course of your playthrough, the short ones that mostly exist to give us new abilities, but there's a lot more here that we haven't talked about. Fridge Duty will see us finding an agent that has been tasked with watching an altered item. This is a fridge that you cannot take your eyes off of or it will move. Langston, the one in charge of the Panopticon, forgot that he was in there and never swapped him out. We can try to rescue him, but he gets killed and we have to travel into the altered item. Here we find a massive being called the Former that we have to defeat. Langston will give us another mission to track down some altered items that have escaped captivity. We have to track many of these down across the oldest house, a traffic light, a Japanese paper lantern, a flamingo that constantly warps hallways. All of these further the idea of altered items in general. Getting to see this many and such a different variety of the paranatural really helps to develop a larger and more fleshed out world for the game. It starts to give us a pretty good idea of what's actually out there. We can find a completely different area inside of the oldest house where Raya Underhill is currently fighting off an active threshold. Thresholds are areas where our reality meets other dimensions, spots that are thin and where two worlds begin to overlap. We can eventually figure out how to defeat some of these mold things walking around and be able to traverse these hidden mold rooms around the oldest house. We can also track down Mr. Tomasi, the one that we fought early in the main missions. 
We can fight off the former again. We can find a mirror version of Jesse called Esej and fight her. We can even help Ati take on different tasks related to cleaning up the building. All of these missions work really well and serve their purpose. They exist to broaden the world of control. They all felt like really contained little side adventures, and they work perfectly. Most of them did result in little boss fights, but I felt like the boss fights were different and special enough that they were worth experiencing. There is one mission here that was not included in the version of Control that I played. It was only available on the PlayStation 4 Digital Deluxe Edition. It features Hideo Kojima playing a man by the name of Dr. Yoshimi Tokiyu, who has his words translated on tapes and we use them to guide us through some interesting tests. There's also an endgame event jukebox that sits just off of Central Executive. We can head here and place tokens inside the machine to take on extra challenges. These challenges can be quite difficult, but will reward us with considerably better mods if we can complete them. I think Control's story is really well done. I do think out of the entire game, it's probably the weakest aspect, though. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward, and there aren't a ton of insane twists along the way, at least ones that we don't really see coming. The main missions themselves are also quite short. The story is intriguing enough for a first entry, but I think I'm more excited to see what they do with this in further games. In Control, the world, gameplay, characters, and just about everything else shines a lot brighter than the main story really does. Before we head on to talk about final thoughts, we should really take some time to talk about the DLC of Control, because it's pretty important to the overall narrative and the Remedy-connected universe in general. There were two DLC released for Control. The first was called The Foundation. The Foundation sees us heading to the hotline to speak to the board. They've opened a door in maintenance and want us to head to it because the oldest house is in trouble. When we get there, the door takes us to the Foundation. The Foundation seems to be the bedrock of the oldest house, the possible lowest point in the place. It's mostly a massive expanse of twisting and weaving caverns. We soon begin to see visions of Marshall, though, the same ones from the hotline that we saw Trench through. This could mean bad news for her. We begin to find memos that talk about cave paintings in the Foundation that seemed at first to be ancient humans. The Bureau later thought that it could be something else down there with them. This expansion adds a new enemy type in that of the Hiss Sharpened. These lumbering goons kind of look like brutes, wielding clubs and seeming very primitive, but they're quick moving and can easily defeat us. We find the nail, some sort of paranatural structure in the foundation that the board wants us to repair. This will prevent a collision with the astral plane. We have to take on a massive astral plane challenge. At the beginning of this challenge, we can choose one of two powers, shape or fracture. Shape will allow us to pull masses of crystal from the ground, creating platforms and also dealing damage to enemies. Fracture will allow us to destroy these crystals, freeing platforms or even pulling barriers out from under our enemies. I thought both of these powers were a great introduction to a DLC, and again, Remedy comes through with a DLC worthy of your dollar. It actually adds something in story, gameplay, environment, and detail. It feels like a genuine extension of the game rather than just a tacked on repeat. The power that you grab first will decide which of two tracks you go down. This will only affect which order you do the DLC missions in, not whether you get to experience them or not. You will always come back and grab the other power and do those missions second. We have to use our new powers to repair different nodes around the foundation. These are floating orbs that are broken or have sprouted crystals off of them. We can eventually find Emily down in the foundation who tells us that we called her down even though we didn't. She tells us that the bleed happening between the astral plane and the oldest house will eventually consume the entire building if we don't repair it. After we repair two of the nodes, the former shows up and decides to broker an alliance with us. This being gives us the other power that the board withheld. The board obviously does not like this and doesn't want us to trust the being. The former seems to have worked with the board at some point, but the two split after the former was blamed for something that we can't understand. Jesse wonders at this point whether she should trust either the former, the board, or neither of them. She once again finds herself in a position where she can't quite pick out the true motivations of the people that advise her. 
When we cleanse the last of the nodes, the astral plane seems to begin to shift or collapse. We travel back to the nail, which is repaired, but Emily has figured out that the nail could possibly be a piece of the astral plane. The friction between the nail and our world could cause destruction of both planes. Jesse then thinks that Marshall's original expedition and efforts to destroy the nail was possibly right. We head to the base of the nail, finding Marshall there, corrupted. She's our final boss. We have to defeat her in waves of every variety and manner of hiss. Jesse then cleanses the nail, and the board says that the issue is solved. We then find out that Marshall tried to destroy the nail because she didn't trust the board. They were possibly trying to make a play to control the oldest house and the bureau. Jesse decides to lead the FBC her own way. There's a couple of side quests that this DLC gives us, like Pope wanting us to find five ID cards scattered around the foundation, or a more interesting one that sees us trying to cleanse an altered item by jumping back and forth on platforms in a very 80s synthwave environment. This DLC isn't bad, and I think it serves as a really good setup for a sequel. It sets up the board as a potential antagonist, and possibly even the former helping us out in the future. We aren't really too sure where alliances lie at the end of the expansion. Either way, it serves as a really good bridge between two entries. It's a great way to continue the story of the main game while also setting up a potential sequel. The second DLC is a little more interesting, at least to me. This one was called AWE and surrounds itself with the character Alan Wake. Again, if you haven't seen my previous video on Alan Wake, I would go check it out now as it's going to provide a lot of background for what I'm going to be talking about here. When we head towards the Sector Elevator, we see a vision of Alan Wake, much like the ones we saw of Trench and the others before, but in black and white. He's writing a story, reading the words that he's writing. In his story, Jesse travels to the Investigation Sector when she senses a distress call. This is a new area that was added for this DLC, a new wing of the oldest house. This sector has seemingly been shut down, taken over by something. There's a lot of interesting memos in here though, investigations into Dr. Darling, some information on containment breaches, and even a memo stating that a Detective Alex Casey was trying to request all the files relating to the incident at Bright Falls. This seems to suggest that Alex Casey has now become a real detective, just like in Wake's novels and a TV show Return from Quantum Break. There was a memo in the base game that specifically listed the Bright Falls incident as an AWE. This DLC explicitly creates the connection between Remedy's games. There's tons of information that the Bureau has on the event, though a lot of it is redacted. They were very much monitoring the situation and keeping an eye on the town. There seemed to also be some sort of struggle between a William Kirkland, the previous head of investigations, and Zachariah Trench. Kirkland was the one that was first notified of the Bright Falls AWE by Frank Breaker. We also find some information showing that Alice Wake showed up to the Bureau regarding something else, and a specimen escaped. We eventually travel to the Ocean View Motel, but this time, Jesse opens another door with a spiral. We hear Alan's voice as if he's speaking to someone. We get wild visions and see him standing in a room with himself. The other version of Alan calls himself Thomas Zane. He says he was pretending to be someone else, that he's a filmmaker. This seems to be some sort of trick, possibly by the dark place, that Alan still finds himself trapped in. Alan takes a drink from this Tom, and he says that Alan has found a way to write it this time. Tom tells Alan not to worry about his double, and Alan gets angry. We're then pushed from the room and see no more. We see another vision of Alan writing his story. This time, it's about Emil Hartman. In his story, Hartman was changed and taken over by a dark presence. The Dark Presence. We eventually realize that Hartman was taken over by the Dark Presence after jumping in Cauldron Lake in a last-ditch effort to control its power. He was then apprehended by the FBC after he became some warped and distorted monster. We will battle this monster multiple times throughout the course of our DLC. He is affected by the light, just like in Alan Wake. There are also spots of darkness that we can shine away by using different light sources. They mostly cover doors and bar our entry. We fight Hartman once in a very dark room, having to power the lights on in the area and drive him off, another time with a train, and finally at the end we get the power to trap and defeat him. This fight can be a little difficult because we have to turn on all the lights without staying in the dark for too long. Once we do that, we can damage him, but he'll eventually knock the lights out once again. Once we finally get enough damage on him and defeat him, Jesse tries to promote Langston to run the investigation sector, but he doesn't want to be involved. 
He does say that there has been activity reported in Bright Falls, Washington, but that the date of the activity says a few years in the future. Agent Estevez is on the scene, though. We then hear Alan speaking once again. Things set in motion. If the alarm's true, then so is the reason for the alarm. The effect must follow the cause. It's happening again. Our turn. This whole DLC is really interesting, and I believe it's set up for what Remedy plans to do in the future. Before we talk about that, though, I just want to again commend this DLC for what the Foundation did as well. It doesn't exactly add any powers like that one did, but it does add some new enemy types and includes the Dark mechanic from Alan Wake. It all works really well, and using one DLC to set up a sequel to Control while also using the other to set up a sequel to Alan Wake is fantastic. I'd like to use this section of the video to just very briefly go over Control's connections to the Remedy universe. Thus far, this game has established itself the most with bringing these three games together and trying to make them one shared world. Now, obviously, the biggest connection that we have here is that Alan Wake literally appears in Control. There is so much information that we're given on Alan Wake and Bright Falls in the AWE DLC. Plus, it also seems like Control recontextualizes everything in that story. The light switch and the typewriter, even, could now be looked at as objects of power. We find proof that Alan was also possibly looked at for the Prime Candidate program. Not only that, but there's tons of little connections as well. If we look back at Alan Wake's American Nightmare, one of the songs can be reversed to say, it will happen again in a town called Ordinary. Ordinary is obviously the place where Jesse and Dylan found the slide projector. Control also does slightly connect to Quantum Break as well. I think these connections are a little bit less obvious, probably because Remedy doesn't own the IP, so they can't begin incorporating it into their games so outright, not yet at least, unless a deal was reached between the two companies. But in Control, Dylan states that he dreams of Mr. Door, a being that sees many worlds side by side, endlessly shifting between them. Kind of seems like Mr. Hatch, right? Alan also says that he needs an invisible door, which is a bit more of a loose connection, but it would be a surefire way out of the dark place. There's also tons of fan theories, like the fact that Courtney Hope plays both Jesse Faden and Beth Wilder, and that this new reality in control could be Jack saving Beth like he said he would at the end of the game. There really are tons of tiny little details in Control that connect to the rest of the world. This game itself sort of opens Pandora's box on the entire thing. It's also heavily implied in the AWE DLC that Alan Wake orchestrated the events of Control, that he was the one that convinced Alice to head to the FBC, that he used his writings in The Powers of Cauldron Lake to give Jesse a crisis and create the hero that he needed to set him free. There's just so much to unpack here, and it really sets up an incredibly interesting foundation for what's to come in the universe. Control is a fantastic game. It is the quintessential Remedy project. They took everything that they learned with their previous games and tried to improve on every area that they could. I don't think this worked perfectly. Clearly, I have issues with the main story that the game presents. It does little in the way of surprise, but the world, atmosphere, aesthetics, gameplay, and mechanics are all top tier. The Oldest House as a setting is incredibly unique. It feels like nothing else we've seen before, blending multiple styles of architecture and design. It also heavily encourages exploration. So many little details are hidden around the world of Control. There are many that we didn't even talk about in this video because it would just draw it out to a ridiculous length. Every document furthers your own imagination. The game wants you to think about things. Think about the world before you got here. Think about how the world itself got here. It also wants you to feel like this place has been lived in, and you're not only uncovering secrets in the game, but secrets that have been hidden to the world forever. The atmosphere of the game is top-notch. The game uses color incredibly well, constantly contrasting the bland, boring offices and backgrounds of the oldest house with huge pops of color to guide your vision and just create an interesting image. Even the title cards for different areas look great. The flat white text jumps out on the screen, creating the perfect snapshot for entering a new zone. 
The aesthetics in general create something new and interesting, a design which uses this classic old technology, feeling like it's been set back decades in the past, but the FBC's knowledge is just so advanced past anything that the general public is even aware of. The game is also just terrific to play. It feels good to fly around and toss objects at groups of hiss, dodging attacks from flying enemies only to unload tons of bullets into them and then seize them to do your bidding always feels awesome. There's a ton of different ways that we can use our powers and that variety always makes for something interesting. What Control does for the future of Remedy games is also top notch. Creating a universe and a shared world for the developers to play around with and tell some very interesting stories in is really exciting. The whole package just works. Even though I harped on the story a little bit, doesn't mean I don't like the game, not by a long shot. The game is still fantastic and amazing. I think the story is just par for the course though for a first entry in a series. But the whole package is something that you absolutely cannot miss. I've played through Control three or four times now, and every time I find new information or am surprised by little details that I never picked up on before. Remedy really brought their A game when mixing in different forms of media. Even though Control never got its own book or prequel series or comic, it feels like that amount of information and story is in Control, just hidden around the oldest house. Control got pretty great reviews, the original version still holding an 85% for the PC version on Metacritic. Most reviewers praised its combat, setting, atmosphere, and design. Some critics pointed out that the story ended abruptly and that its mission structure was odd, though. Fans were just as happy about Remedy's new project. The game had sold 2 million units in just over a year and had become Remedy's fastest growing IP since Max Payne. By November of 2022, the game had reached 3 million units sold. Control was nominated for tons of awards at Golden Joystick, the Game Awards, the Dice Awards, too many to list here. It did go on to win the Critics' Choice Award at Golden Joystick, Best Art Direction at the Game Awards, and the Action Game of the Year at the Dice Awards. Remedy has a ton of projects under their belt right now, but they seem to be planning a sequel to Control that's larger and with a bigger budget. They're also planning a multiplayer spin-off, so it certainly seems like this series isn't going to be dead in the water or take over a decade to find its new entry. With that being said, that's the last we've seen of the Remedy shared universe, for now. With Alan Wake 2 on the horizon, something is sure to be coming soon. But we'll talk about that next time. Bye, Dad.